Coming up, 2016 Subaru Outback CVT goes poopy in its trousers out on the highway. Like, that wasn't in the script. It's also quite undignified. Just ask ScoMo. And moreover, like... This is an $11,600 problem suddenly, and I'd suggest that's not how consumer law works, and also this is how relationships with brands get torpedoed in the service department. I'm John Cadogan from autoexpert.com.au, and I get new cars cheap for buyers here in Australia. Website for that, obviously. Or you can just click the card that was not towed up there. Not at all. Using a CVT equipped vehicle, that's for damn sure. This message comes from a dude named Will Toms, and I'll be referring to that in my notes from time to time in this report. Will goes... I purchased a new Subaru Outback Premium in June of 2016. My wife and I had retired and we now live on the aged pension. We expected that this car would be our last new vehicle. Fair enough. The car is garaged, treated with care and serviced every six months in accordance with the logbook. And I'd say, well done, dude, because that is so important when it comes to issues of this nature. Will goes on, he says, the car is five and a half years old and has travelled only 80,000 kilometres since new. So that's not all that much when you think about it. Probably about average or something. So this means the car has been serviced on average about every 7,300 kilometres. The car has never been off-road and has never towed anything. It is not even fitted with a tow bar. So there's that. On the 22nd of January, so roughly a month ago, while travelling to Sydney from our home on the Gold Coast, just outside Coffs Harbour, which is kind of up, I don't know, broadly halfway, then that's about 900 k's in terms of overall trip, so probably about 450 into it or something, you know. And Anyway, the automatic CVT transmission started to make a noise. I limped into Coffs Harbour and left the car with the local Subaru dealership, Jeff King Motors. And that's how this is supposed to work, isn't it? I mean, the car's not supposed to do that, but having a support network en route is kind of helpful, you'd think. I contacted the dealership and Subaru Straya on Monday and expressed my belief that because the car has only travelled 80,000 k's and that it is only six months out of its five-year warranty that the replacement of the transmission should be covered under some kind of warranty. Yeah, it should be, in my view also. To determine the root cause of the breakdown of the transmission, it was removed and sent to A and B Automatic Transmissions in Melbourne for analysis. And I'd say, WTF? Like, when you look at a car maker website, they go on and on endlessly about their highly qualified technicians being the only ones who are able to provide, you know, this and that and A-level support, bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Okay, so why does an authorised service centre, like a Subaru dealer in Coffs Harbour, need to send a transmission to Melbourne, which has got to be 1500 k's away to diagnose a fault i don't get that like you've got to drive straight past sydney to do that for starters which is like 450 k's closer come on like i really don't understand why that has to happen to diagnose a problem with the transmission that just sounds like abject bullshit and if that is true it really does paint a picture of the level, the true level of service quality, doesn't it, versus the rhetoric in the website. So anyway, I don't know if that's the policy or not to send all transmissions there for diagnosis, but if it is, it just seems flat out whacked and out of line with the rhetoric about the technical training and the expertise, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, their analysis found that the failure was caused by oil leaking from the front diff into the automatic transmission through a failed seal. And I guess that makes sense. Although I was asked to pay 1500 bucks for this analysis, the dealership will not forward the report to me. Well done, Jeff King Automotive. 
yes. Dude pays 1500 bucks for a report and yet you won't give it to him. Like, in what universe is that moral and ethical? And obviously I'm only relying on Mr Tom's uh, version of events here and the truth may be different, but Jesus Christ, if that is true, that is flat-out unfair, immoral, unethical, etc., anti-consumer, in my view. I'm working on what I was told over the telephone, Mr Tom says, and I'd suggest that... It's a standard operating procedure of dealerships when there is any dispute to minimise the transfer of information to make it hard for you if you decide to go to DEFCON 1, right? It's just how this works. Based on the A&B report, Mr Tom says Subaru Australia has declined to pay for the repair under what they call their goodwill policy. We'll get back to that because that's kind of important. That's such a large chunk of bullshit. I'd have to sit down and swallow it over several meals because that's not how things work. Anyway, we'll get to that. They base their decision on the fact that the failure was not within the transmission but rather the seal between the differential and the transmission, to which I would retort, who gives a fuck what failed? The car has not been reasonably durable. Anyway, uh, he goes on and says, however, this seal is not a serviceable part. It has not been leaking, to my knowledge, because my garage floor is clean and free from any oils. And I'd suggest that that's probably a misunderstanding about how the front transaxle works. Uh, Mr Tom says, the seal must have failed during my trip from the Gold Coast. Well, I don't think so, because the CVT and the front differential are sort of together in the one unit called a transaxle and hypothetically it would be possible for a seal to fail in the differential and then oil to leak into the transmission without physically spilling any oil on the garage floor, okay? Because it's basically a transaxle is a differential and a transmission together and that's what gets the drive to the front end of the symmetrical all-wheel drive and then to the rear end they've got a split a prop shaft that runs all the way back with a sort of universal joint or whatever kind of uh, flexible joint in the centre of it. Anyway, that's just a misunderstanding and that's completely okay as well on the part of Mr Toms because he doesn't have to understand the mechanical layout of the car. He just has to pay for it and quote-unquote enjoy it, right? He says any reasonable person would expect 10 years or 200,000 kilometres for a part like this. Shouldn't this seal be expected to last the reasonably expected life of the car? Yes, it absolutely should, especially if it's not serviceable. And even if it is serviceable, you've had the car serviced. It's meant to be reasonably durable. And this is the central overarching thesis of the rest of this discussion, okay? He says, Jeff King Motors has quoted 11,600 bucks. Now, presumably that's on top of the, whatever it was, 12 or 1,500 bucks to investigate the problem in the first part. So we're looking here, if that's the case, at about a 13,000 buck repair for a couple of old age pensioners. Right. I need a car, so I have authorised the repair and I'm hoping to pick the car up next week. I am appealing for your help to encourage Subaru Strayer to be reasonable and cover the cost of the repair. Yours sincerely, Will Toms. Now, let's just discuss that for a moment, shall we? Because many consumers are ignorant about how consumer law works and there's really no excuse for that, okay, because... Consumer law changed on the 1st of January 2011. It was the old one was thrown out and the new one was was ushered in. And this is kind of important because they're chalk and cheese. Like in the previous regime prior to the 1st of January 2011, when the warranty on a product expired, whether or not you got support from the retailer or the manufacturer slash importer of that product was absolutely down to them. And some of those manufacturers had quote-unquote, goodwill policies where they would help you out by covering, say, part of the cost of the repair, maybe supplying the parts, and you might pay the labour at the dealership, for example. But whether or not they did that or just bent you over and charged you the full freight because you were, you know, seven days out of warranty or something, that was completely up to them. And they made a determination, I suppose, based on what would be the potential damage to the brand if they just bent you over versus whether or not you would become an ambassador for them or choose to do business with them again, right? But after the 1st of January 2011, which was 
friggin' more than 11 years ago now, that changed. The current version of Australian consumer law has a guarantee, a legislated guarantee of acceptable quality, right? You can go to the ACCC's website and and search for ACCC consumer guarantees. Just go to Google, ACCC consumer guarantees. It's up there, okay? Look at acceptable quality and that guarantee covers a thing called reasonable durability, all right? It says words to the effect of goods and services must be reasonably durable, okay? And that means meet the reasonable expectations of a consumer. And the reason they don't say this is blah, like 10 years or 160,000 kilometres in the legislation is because it covers everything. It covers everything from this fucking centre punch to something like a car. Okay, and obviously, you know, if you buy something, I don't know, like a pen or something, the durability expectations of a pen for a pen are different to that for a car. If a pen lasts you 12 months, you've done really well. If a car only lasts you 12 months, kind of sucks, yeah? So that's why the legislation doesn't define what is reasonable in the case of all consumer products, because essentially that legislation would be endless. And reasonable is ultimately determined by a court if push comes to shove. But it's pretty clear that with a car, because you're paying 40 or 50 grand for something like an Outback, then a consumer should expect that to last 10 years and some distance like 160 to 200,000 Ks. That seems reasonable to me and it probably would seem reasonable to the court as well. And obviously the failures do not cover things that wear out ordinarily in the course of business like brakes and tyres, for example, or globes on various lights, you know, things of that nature. They're not covered. But things like drive lines they're covered, provided you didn't abuse the car by parking it in the ocean or by towing an Abrams tank across the country or Christ knows, you know, or just by not getting it serviced, which is a form of abuse also. It sounds to me, and I'm only basing this on Mr Tom's description of events here, so he could have one version and the dealership and Subaru might have another version, but if we just run with Mr Tom's version as being substantially true and it doesn't sound like he's kind of, you know, trying to con me here. It sounds like a desperate appeal for assistance to me. So on the balance of probability, I'm going to assume substantial truth here. Now, and I'm also a Machiavellian cock. Just ask any car maker, all right? So I'd suggest that there's a couple of things that might be happening in the background here. Because the dealership is unwilling to release the report, okay, I'm wondering if that's actually what it says, okay? That's point number one. The point number two would be, why is the dealership unable to diagnose a problem? Because that sounds like bullshit to me. It really does. And then the further case of bullshit is, is Subaru Australia actually adopting the position described by the dealership, you know, by the dealership based on Mr. Tom's description? Because... It's financially a hell of a lot more profitable for a dealership to convince you that Subaru Australia, for example, has declined to cover the cost of repairs. Because in the case of a consumer law claim where the product has not been reasonably durable, what Subaru Australia will do is supply the transmission and the dealership's going to fit it. And then the dealership is going to send Subaru Australia a bill for their labour, but Subaru Australia will send a bill for much less than they would bill Mr Tom's for the same repair because Subaru has negotiated a discount labour rate for this kind of thing for these kind of repairs, okay? So the other salient thing about this is supplying an expensive part like the transmission. That is done at cost by Subaru Australia. They just ship it to the dealer and the dealer just fits it and they don't get to add their customary billion percent markup, okay? So the bottom line is the dealership is incentivized, if you like, or they're, they're vulnerable to incentivization to tell you that there's no goodwill claim whatsoever 
and you're up for the full freight. And if they do that, they're going to make a shitload more money out of you if you agree to it, okay? Whereas consumer law is very clear. It just says that if a product has not met the durability expectations of a reasonable consumer, then in cases like this, warranty-like support, like a warranty-like resolution, is legislated. That means it's not fucking optional. It's part of the law, okay? And you don't really get to choose. And any dealership that uses the term goodwill right? Goodwill. Fuck right off. That's 11 years out of date. That pertains to legislation that was made obsolete 11 years ago. So shame on you, Jeff King Automotive, if you did actually use the term goodwill, because in my view, that is evidence, at least strongly suggestive of trying to manipulate a consumer into paying the full freight because they are apparently ignorant of the current Australian consumer law and the guarantee of acceptable quality and the implications for all of that. So what I'm going to do here, Will, rather than just reach out to all and sundry, is I'm going to name, I have named and shamed that dealership. I think that's unconscionable to adopt that position. I think on the balance of probability that your complaint sounds reasonably genuine and substantially true, and if those facts that, uh, if, if what you've said is fact, then the dealership is required to offer you a resolution that involves no cost to you, including this diagnosis, like fuck right off. You know, it's shameful that a genuine Subaru outlet cannot diagnose a fault with a genuine Subaru transmission. And it's ridiculous that it has to be shipped from Coffs Friggin Harbour all the way to Melbourne. That's absurd. And for you to have to pay for that, that's anti-consumer. I just don't get it. I don't get why it's got to go all the way to Melbourne. Is there, what, is there nobody in Sydney or Newcastle or somewhere closer? No transmission specialist who could diagnose this? And why doesn't Subaru seemingly train every dealership to diagnose every potential fault with every potential vehicle? Because every dealership sells every vehicle. That just gobsmacks me. Now, as you know, if you're a regular viewer of this channel, I have mad love for Subaru. I've owned four brand new Subarus and I love them. Every time I drive something like a WRX or an STI, I love it. They're awesome cars. So what's at risk here from behavior like this is my faith in the brand. And I don't know if the dealership is faithfully uh, representing Subaru Australia's position on all of this, but if they are, that's shameful from a Subaru Australia point of view too, in my view, because consumer law is not optional and it should not be up to a consumer to get the gloves on and get into the ring with a far more powerful opponent and slog it out in consumer court when there's a clear-cut case, seemingly, of a failed seal in a differential that has leaked the wrong oil into the CVT and essentially killed it, requiring its replacement. And if that's possible, and it happens more than once every grand alignment of the planets, that's kind of a massive design flaw that has to be bean counter driven because it is possible to put together a seal on a differential between a diff and a CVT that has lifelong integrity. Don't bullshit me about they just fail sometimes. That's emblematic of underdone R&D. And if it's just a one-off, then the dealer should say, that's terrible, we're going to look after it. And Subaru should go, here's your transmission, sorry for the inconvenience. So I'm going to call on Subaru Australia to get on the front foot here and just help out Mr. Toms. And look, if this is not a faithful representation of the actual events and Mr. Toms is bullshitting me, let's just, you know, canvas that as a possibility, then I will come back to you in a video like this and I will faithfully put Subaru Australia's position and the dealership's position to you as well. But as things stand with the information at hand, I think this is flat out shameful and this frown should go upside down at no cost to Mr. Toms if this is a faithful representation of the facts, right? 
Any other conduct here seems to me to be frankly unconscionable and anti-consumer for anybody who's put their funds on the line because that's not just buying a new car. That is saying out of the 60 different brands selling cars in Australia, I've chosen yours. I have faith in yours. And this is a bilateral relationship for the term of ownership. The commitment is made by the consumer up front and yet it appears to me that the response is anything but in line with the intent of Australian consumer law and also just anti-consumer. This is like just drop your strides and bend over and let's commence docking procedures. And very disappointing. So anyway, I'd like Mr. Toms, if you see this, this is what I can uh, basically do to highlight your issue. After all, I'm not a magician. I'm just a journalist who reports this and that, and I'm reporting what you've said to me. And that means Jeff King Automotive and Subaru Australia are going to watch, and they're going to be aware that 30,000 other Australians are going to watch as well. And if they want to get back to me with their version of events and oh my God, sorry, we dropped the ball on this and we're turning this frown upside down. I'm happy to faithfully report that as well, if that's ultimately what happens. What I'd like to know from you is, if you own a Subaru, have you had a problem like that with the CVT? Because my take on this, right, is that Subaru's CVTs are okay from a durability point of view, which means better than, say, Nissan, not as good as, say, Toyota. And the other point I'd make here, right, is that in other markets, like in America, for example, Subaru has had a CVT reliability problem. And my understanding there is that they upped the warranty on the CVT to something like 10 years and whatever it was, 100,000 miles or something, whichever comes first, which is 160 odd thousand kilometres. So, you know, there's evidence in other markets that Houston, we had a problem. And I'm not sure that Subaru's done any such thing here. And they shouldn't have to anyway, because of those provisions of acceptable quality and reasonable durability in consumer law. Anyway, if you've had a Subaru and it's had a problem with the CVT, let me know what happened. Did you get hit with a bill you couldn't jump over? Or did Subaru get on it and just look after you? And was the impediment, if there was one, was it with the dealer or was it with Subaru or did they join forces and just kind of screw you over? Please let me know. That'd be really interesting research for me because I want to give prospective consumers the best possible ownership advice. And if this is sort of a widespread thing that I'm unaware of, I might have to rethink my faith in the Subaru brand because, you know, drumming out, dusting off the old chestnut of we're going to decline to look out for you based on some goodwill that's 11 years out of date, based on legislation that essentially hasn't existed for more than a decade. I mean, come on, you guys can do better than this at dealership level and also at corporate headquarters.